Man, Revelation chapter 18, and the title of my sermon tonight is, Who is End Times Babylon? Who is the End Times Babylon? Now, the reason I'm preaching about this is because we have the movie premiere coming this Tuesday night for our new film, Babylon USA. And don't worry, I'm not going to preach the film tonight. So it's not like I'm going to preach tonight. You go, well, great, I don't even need to see the movie. What I'm preaching tonight is basically a lot of stuff that's not in the film. This is not what the film covers. But I do want to talk a little bit about the film and explain to you why we made this film, what's the rationale behind this film, and what's the purpose of the film. Now, first of all, I want to say this. The films that we've made in the past, After the Tribulation, New World Order Bible Versions, Marching to Zion, and now this film, the goal with these films is to reach people. The goal is to reach people with the gospel of Jesus Christ so that they could be saved. And then the goal is also to edify God's people and to increase their knowledge of the word of God and increase their sound doctrine and, and help them to learn something and grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And these films are very effective tools at reaching people. In fact, who here tonight either got saved watching one of those films or you found out about our church through one of those films. That was how you first found out about the church. Look around. So it looks like it works as a way to reach people, right? So this film, because a lot of people say, you know, why make this film? Why make a film like Babylon USA? Well, the purpose is to reach people with the gospel and also to reach people that are already saved and expose them to hard preaching, expose them to our soul winning program and everything else that we do at this church. And these films are literally viewed by millions of people and God willing, this one's gonna be the same way. You know, after the tribulation now, the English version has about five million viewers. The Spanish version, even just one upload of it has like 13 million views, 13 million, more than English. New World Order Bible Versions has over a million viewers just on one single upload. Marching Design is on a lot of different uploads. It adds up to over a million. So it's just a lot of people watch these. And Babylon USA is to reach a completely different audience. You know, each of the three films kind of reach a different audience. And Babylon USA is going to reach new people that we haven't reached with the other films. And it ends with a plea for people to be saved. It's a film about the wrath of God, and so it ends pleading with people to receive Jesus Christ as Savior so that they're not on the receiving end of God's wrath. That's the purpose of the film. Now, with that being said, the subject of who Babylon is in the end times, this is not a major doctrine. This is not some important doctrine of the faith where you have to be right about this. You know, we're talking about Bible prophecy and different people have different interpretations and sometimes we see through a glass darkly and as we get closer to the end, things come clearer. So I want you to understand that if you don't agree with everything about the film or if you don't agree with all these finer points of, of Bible prophecy, you know, this isn't really the most important doctrine. This is not a deal-breaking doctrine. It's not a primary doctrine. It's not even really a secondary doctrine. It's, it's almost a tertiary doctrine, okay? So if, if people have a different view on Babylon, it's no big deal. And I think that they could still enjoy the film because I think anyone who believes the Bible would have to agree with a large portion of the film because a lot of the film is just teaching the Bible and preaching a lot of timeless biblical truths that would have been true 500 years ago or would still be true 500 years from now if the Lord tarries that long, which I don't believe that he will. So with all that being said, you know, who is end times Babylon? What does the Bible teach? Well, if you would flip over in your Bible to Revelation chapter 16. Revelation chapter 16. Let me start out by just giving you an overview of this subject. We just read Revelation chapter 18 and it was about the destruction of a physical place. That's pretty clear in Revelation 18. There's going to be some physical place that's going to be destroyed in the end times, right before the millennium, after God has already poured out all his wrath and the seven trumpets, the seven vials, right at the very end, great Babylon comes in remembrance before God to give unto her the cup of the wine of the fierceness of his wrath. This is basically the last stage of pouring out God's wrath right before the battle of Armageddon. And if you would look at 
Revelation chapter 16, verse 17, just so we can get the timing here. And the seventh angel poured out his vial into the air, and there came a great voice out of the temple of heaven from the throne, saying, It is done. And there were voices and thunders and lightnings, and there was a great earthquake, such as was not since men were upon the earth, so mighty an earthquake and so great. And the great city was divided into three parts, and the cities of the nations fell. And great Babylon came in remembrance before God to give unto her the cup of the wine of the fierceness of his wrath. So it's pretty obvious when you read this that God's been pouring out a lot of wrath and doing a lot of judgment, but now there's one last thing that he needs to take care of. That's why he says, great Babylon came in remembrance before God to give unto her the cup of the wine of the fierceness of his wrath. He remembers that Babylon has not been destroyed yet. It has not been sufficiently judged. Babylon has not received what's coming to it yet. He says in verse 20, And every island fled away, and the mountains were not found. And there fell upon men a great hail out of heaven, every stone about the weight of a talent. And men blasphemed God because of the plague of the hail, for the plague thereof was exceeding great. And then in chapters 17 and 18, we're just dedicating those whole chapters to the subject of Babylon. It's what chapter 17 is about. It's what chapter 18 is about. Now, if there are two entire chapters dedicated to this subject, it's a pretty big subject in the Bible. It's covered a little bit in other chapters in Revelation. It's mentioned in chapter 14, chapter 16, chapter 19. But, I mean, two entire Long chapters in the book of Revelation are dedicated to it because it's important. Now, let me just back up and explain to you the concept of who the end times Babylon is or, or what Babylon represents. Now, all the way back in the beginning, you have the Tower of Babel. And that represented a one world government or a one world religion. Because instead of being scattered abroad on the earth, they all joined together into one system instead of being into nations like God had commanded them. And then not only that, but they have a false religion where they're trying to build their own way to heaven or work their own way to heaven. Then later that place becomes Babylon. Then later Babylon passes the torch to Persia, passes the torch to Greece, passes the torch to Rome. And at the time of Christ, the Roman Empire was a Babylon. So throughout history, the geography changes, but the attitude remains the same. That same spirit of Babylon that represents one world government, one world religion, that spirit of luxurious riches and uh, um, decadence, that spirit of whoredom, that spirit of idolatry. There's a continuous thread from the Tower of Babel all the way until now. So throughout history, various places have been a Babylon. Now, the Bible will often use places like Sodom or Babylon to represent another place because they're like that place. So, for example, he calls Judah Sodom because of all the sodomy that they were into and all the wickedness that they did that was similar to what Sodom had been into. So he calls them Sodom. We could also refer to Berlin, Germany in the 1920s as a Sodom. It was like Sodom. Today, we might point to a portion of San Francisco and say it's a Sodom and Gomorrah there, or part Las Vegas, or other cities that are just kind of dens of iniquity. We would point to those as a Sodom. So what does it mean to be a Babylon? It means a place, or an empire, or a nation, or a city that is like unto Babylon of old. Now, why not literal Babylon? You know, when the Bible talks about Babylon being destroyed, how do we know it's not the literal Babylon? Well, simply because that city no longer exists. So obviously, uh, it can't be that. Now, now, someone asked the question, well, what if you were on a desert island? They, they took exception to looking at current events to interpret the Bible. And they said, well, what would you come up with if you were on a desert island reading the Bible? What then? If I were on a desert island reading the Bible, I would walk away thinking it was the literal city of Babylon. But because I don't live on a desert island, because I, you know, live in the real world and can see things happening around me, I know that that place no longer exists. So it must be symbolic of something else. It cannot be literal since that city doesn't exist, let alone is that city a place where all the merchants of the earth do business and all these other things happen. It just doesn't make any sense. So it can't be a literal Babylon. So the question is, who is the end times Babylon? 
Who is the city or place or nation or geography that is being destroyed in Revelation 18? Remember, it's not literal. It's not the literal Babylon. It's not Iraq, okay? It is some other place that is being nuked into oblivion that's going to be destroyed in one hour, that's going to be burned and destroyed in one day. What is that place? Well, a lot of people have said, well, you know, it's the Roman Catholic Church. And that theory is, is probably the most prevalent amongst independent fundamental Baptist churches. Now, let me say this. That's not a bad teaching because of the fact that you'd have to be blind not to realize that the Roman Catholic Church is a Babylon. It does represent the spirit of Babylon. How could you say that the Roman Catholic Church is not a manifestation of Babylon when it is called the universal church? What does Catholic mean? Universal. So obviously the Roman Catholic Church is a manifestation of Babylon because look at the idolatry, look at the universal nature, look at how it's an apostate, counterfeit Christianity. Of course it's a Babylon. But it's not the only Babylon. You could look at Hinduism and say that it's like unto Babylon. Why? Because it's also a religion that came from the Tower of Babel. It's also a goddess that they're worshiping. And they're also, you know, they've killed saints and, and prophets and different martyrs and people. The, the point is that you can't just pin that tail on one donkey. Because there have been multiple religious institutions, political institutions, financial institutions throughout history that have been like Babylon. And the Vatican is one of them. Rome is one of them. The Persian Empire is one of them. Alexander the Great and his empire was one of them. The Bible connects that with Babylon. In fact, there's one statue that, that consists of Babylon, Persia, Greece, and Rome. One contiguous statue. So obviously, Rome was a Babylon. There's no question about that. But that's not really what's relevant when we're looking at Revelation 18. When we're looking at Revelation 18 and the end of chapter 17, the real question is, what is the specific geographic place that comes into remembrance before God to give unto her the cup of the wine of the fierceness of his wrath in the very end times? That's the relevant question. So you could find all these attributes between the Roman Catholic Church and Babylon, and I'll say amen. Amen to that. It's, it, it, it definitely partakes of the mystery Babylon religion. No question about that. But is Rome, Italy, or Vatican City the place that is wiped out in Revelation 18? I don't believe it for one second. And I'll show you why tonight. And another theory that I've heard, and this seems to be a newer theory. I'd never heard of it until probably like five years ago. Now I hear about it all the time, is this theory that Jerusalem is Babylon. And let me just say this. I'm not mad at anybody who believes that, but I'm just going to give my personal opinion. I think that that is the dumbest theory in regard to Babylon that anyone has ever put forth. In fact, I would be more likely to believe any city is Babylon other than Jerusalem. You could convince me more readily that Rio de Janeiro, Brazil is Babylon of the end times. I would, I would sooner believe that theory than I would believe that Jerusalem is Babylon. Because Jerusalem is the one place that it's impossible that it could ever be Babylon because of the fact that Jerusalem plays a different role in end times prophecy. You know, that character has already got a role. He's already got a part. You know, it's like in the, in the board game Clue. Look, we are, it's like you, once you realize Colonel Mustard couldn't have done it. He didn't even have access to the candlestick. Okay, so, you know, you can eliminate, use the process of elimination. Jerusalem doesn't make any sense. It's impossible for it to be Jerusalem. And literally, I would find it easier to believe that it's Seattle, Washington, or Rio de Janeiro, Brazil, or, or, or any Barcelona, for crying out loud. I'm not kidding. I'm dead serious. Because, you know, you could at least convince yourself that maybe hundreds of years from now, if, you know, if, if Christ isn't going to return in our lifetime, hundreds of years from now, some great empire would raise up in one of these other cities. It could be possible that it could be, you know, Honolulu, Hawaii or whatever. No, I'm just kidding. But anyway, I just saw you from Hawaii. It made me think of that. So, but the point is that, you know, it can't be Jerusalem. It's just not biblical. Now, if you believe that, like I said, this isn't some important doctrine to split over or, or to get in a fight over. 
but I, I think it's a half-baked theory. Now, let me give you some reasons why. First of all, in Revelation 18, where we saw it, the merchants are mourning. That's like half the chapter. Nobody buys our merchandise anymore. We are saying Jerusalem is not a great consumer of merchandise. Not only that, but ba Babylon, when it's destroyed in chapter 8, says, Oh, behold, I sit a queen and am no widow and shall see no sorrow. Jerusalem's never said that. Jerusalem is constantly in danger, constantly in peril. It's one of the most dangerous, scary places to be. So why would they just think, oh man, nobody can touch us. Nobody can mess with us. It doesn't make any sense. Nobody's uh, exporting all their merchandise into Israel. Okay, if Jerusalem were destroyed, no merchants would weep and mourn. The merchants of the earth have not been, been made rich by Jerusalem or been made rich by Israel, by the costliness. Uh, Jerusalem does not live in decadence and luxury and, and wealth and all these things that we see describing this place that's destroyed in Revelation 18. But not only that, and this is one of the biggest reasons why it can't be Jerusalem, is that when Babylon's destroyed, it's never going to be inhabited again. The Bible's really clear on that in both Jeremiah 51 and in Revelation chapter 18, verse 21. It says that it will never be inhabited again. Now, what kind of ridiculous idea is this that says, oh yeah, Jerusalem's going to be wiped out and never inhabited again, and then the same month, Jesus Christ is going to rule and reign from... Jerusalem. Now, th that's just silly because if the place is wiped out and blown to smithereens and he's like, he's never going to be inhabited. It's, it, it's just a cage of every foul spirit and unclean devil. And then Jesus is going to rule and reign from there. Now, here's what the Jerusalem people will say. Oh, the new Jerusalem. The new Jerusalem comes down after the millennium. So you're just about a thousand years off on that timeline. The new Jerusalem comes down descends from heaven in Revelation 21 a thousand years later. So don't tell me, oh, he destroyed the old one and he brings down the new one. Not how it's going to work. A thousand years go by before that new one comes down. But not only that, and this is a pretty uh, powerful proof, Jerusalem is judged and desolated at the midpoint of Daniel's 70th week. Three and a half years before Babylon is destroyed. Go, if you would, to Luke chapter 21. Let me show you that in the Bible. Luke chapter 21. Luke chapter number 21. And another reason uh, why this doesn't make any sense is that if you actually study the Bible and see who it is that's wiping out Babylon, who is it that, that hates the whore and, and burns her with fire and destroys her? Well, the Bible says it's the ten kings. And it says that the ten kings have one mind with the Antichrist, with the beast. And they're doing his will by wiping out the great whore, by destroying Babylon. Well, here's my question. If the Antichrist is ruling and reigning from Jerusalem, which I, we all know that, right? That the Antichrist is going to rule and reign from Jerusalem. That's where he sets up his throne and his kingdom. If the Antichrist is ruling and reigning from Jerusalem, why would he nuke himself? Why would he nuke his own city? That doesn't make any sense. Why would he hate his own city and nuke it and burn down the house on himself and the seat of his own kingdom? I mean, that's just ridiculous. It's clearly some other place that the ten kings and the Antichrist are going to turn on and destroy. It's got to be somewhere. That's why I said Rio is a better theory. Now, I don't subscribe to the Rio theory. I don't even think there is a Rio theory. But I'm just saying... It makes more sense than Jerusalem theory. Now go if you would to Luke chapter 21, verse 20. Luke chapter 21, verse 20. This is a parallel passage with Matthew chapter 24 when it comes to the tribulation and the, the, the coming of Christ in the clouds. Look what the Bible says in verse 20 of Luke 21. And when ye shall see Jerusalem compassed with armies, then know that the desolation thereof is nigh. Then let them which are in Judea flee to the mountains, and let them which are in the midst of it depart out, and let not them that are in the countries enter therein too. Does this sound familiar from Matthew 24? For these be the days of vengeance that all things which are written 
may be fulfilled. Oh, just kidding. Most of them are going to be fulfilled three and a half years later when I remember to judge Babylon. Is that what it's? No way. What's he saying? At the midpoint when this is happening, when the desolation of Jerusalem is happening, those are the days of vengeance. And that's when all things that are written are going to be fulfilled on Jerusalem. But woe unto them that are with child and to them that give suck in those days. For there shall be great distress in the land and wrath upon this people. Right? The people in Jerusalem and Judea at that time. And they shall fall by the edge of the sword and shall be led away captive into all nations. And Jerusalem shall be trodden down of the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. And there shall be signs in the sun and in the moon and in the stars and upon the earth distress of nations with perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring, men's hearts failing them for fear and for looking after those things which are coming on the earth. For the powers of heaven shall be shaken and then shall they see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. And when these things begin to come to pass, then look up and lift up your heads for your redemption draweth nigh. So it's pretty clear here that Jerusalem is trodden underfoot. Jerusalem is desolated. Jerusalem receives vengeance and wrath right before what? Right before Christ comes in the clouds and we look up and our redemption draweth nigh. Whereas Babylon is destroyed when? At the very end of God pouring out his wrath after the seventh vial. So these events are separated by approximately three and a half years. This is another reason why that Jerusalem theory makes absolutely no sense. Go to Revelation chapter 11 and I'll show you that timing a little more clearly. Last book in the Bible, Revelation chapter 11. Some would take a, a preterist interpretation and say, oh well, this all already happened, you know, because Jerusalem was wiped out once before in AD 70 and again in AD 135. But that's ridiculous because think about how many things in the Bible didn't happen back then. Jesus didn't come in the clouds. The dead in Christ didn't rise first. Those which were alive and remain weren't caught up together with them in the clouds. Look, that stuff is all yet to come in the future. All right. Look at Revelation chapter 11. There was given me a reed like unto a rod. Verse 1. And the angel stood saying, Rise and measure the temple of God and the altar and them that worship therein. But the court which is without the temple, leave out and measure it not. For it is given unto the Gentiles, and the holy city shall they tread underfoot forty and two months. So just as we saw back in Luke 21, that Jerusalem was going to be desolated and trodden underfoot until the times of the Gentiles will be fulfilled, here it says that Jerusalem will be trodden underfoot for how long? Forty and two months, which is how long? Three and a half years. So it's wiped out and desolated at the midpoint, and it lies desolate until the end. Why? Because that's when Christ is going to come, and they're going to rebuild and dwell there, and Christ is going to rule and reign for a thousand years. But it's going to be inhabited, all right, by Jesus and the saints and so forth. Verse 3, And I'll give power unto my two witnesses, and they shall prophesy a thousand two hundred and threescore days clothed in sackcloth. This is the same period of time. The same three and a half years, 1260 days that Jerusalem is desolate, that's the same period of time that the two witnesses are going to be preaching, right? Jump down, if you would, to verse 8. This is when the two witnesses are killed at the end of their prophecy. So three and a half years later, right? So the midpoint is when Jerusalem begins to be desolate, and then that's when the witnesses start preaching, and then they preach for three and a half years, 1,203 score days, 42 months, that's all three and a half years, and then they're killed at the end of that time. And what does it say in Revelation 11:8? And their dead bodies shall lie in the street of the great city, which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt, where also our Lord was crucified. Now that city, that great city there, is clearly referring to Jerusalem. Why? Because it started out by talking about Jerusalem in verses 1 and 2, being trodden underfoot of the Gentiles, and it talks about the temple of God, which we know the temple is going to be there in Jerusalem. And so it makes perfect sense that these witnesses are preaching over there and that's where they're killed. That's where they're laying in the street. So notice that the great city where the two witnesses lie dead is not spiritually called Babylon. Wouldn't this be a great place for God to tell us, 
hey, they're going to lie in the street of that great city which is spiritually called Babylon. That, this would be a perfect opportunity for God to tell us that. But instead, God relates it to two other places. He says it's spiritually called Sodom and Egypt. We're also our Lord. Oh, and, oh, and it's also spiritually called Babylon. And hey, let's judge it, even though we already did three and a half years later, but let's act like it's brand new judgment. It doesn't make any sense. Which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt, where also our Lord was crucified. Now, one of the big things that this Babylon equals Jerusalem theory rests upon or relies upon is the idea, well, if it says great city, I mean, great city, great city. But I submit to you that Phoenix is a great city. Amen? Amen. Nineveh is called a great city. There are cities in the Bible that I've never even heard of and can barely pronounce that are called a great city. If you just look up the term great city... So uh, that's not a strong piece of evidence because the great city here, the great city, I don't think anyone would disagree that this is referring to Jerusalem. The great city, why? Because that's where Jesus was crucified. But the proponents of this theory will say, well, the Bible flat out says that Jesus was crucified in Babylon. Um, no, it doesn't say that anywhere. It says right here, that he was crucified in a city that's spiritually called Sodom and Egypt, where the two witnesses are going to preach. That's talking about Jerusalem. Now, with that in mind, go to Revelation 16. Revelation chapter 16, with that in mind, look what the Bible says in verse 17. The seventh angel poured out his vial into the air. There came a great voice out of the temple of heaven from the throne saying, It is done. And there were voices and thunders and lightnings and there was a great earthquake such as was not since men were upon the earth. So mighty an earthquake and so great. And the great city. So what do you think we're probably referring to based on what we read in Revelation 11? The great city is probably referring to Jerusalem since that was called the great city back in chapter 11. You know, the great city which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt. So it says, and the great city was divided into three parts. And the cities of the nations fell. And great Babylon came in remembrance before God to give unto her the cup of the wine of the fierceness of his wrath. Now, I can't for the life of me figure out how anybody could read verse 19 and think that the great city is the same as Babylon when we're clearly talking about three different judgments on three different geographies. I mean, does everybody see that? Because it says the great city is divided into three parts. From what? From the earthquake that took place. There's a great earthquake, and it, it basically breaks the city apart into three parts. Then it says the cities of the nations fell. And I believe this is referring to skyscrapers coming down, falling, because of the great tremor, the great earthquake. It's, it's going to be the greatest earthquake of all time. It's going to bring down some buildings. They're not going to be engineered for this because it's going to be so mighty an earthquake and so great. And great Babylon came in remembrance before God to give unto her the cup of the wine of the fierceness of his wrath. A plain reading of the text here shows that they've not already received what's coming to them. That's item three on the agenda. Item one was an earthquake that affected Jerusalem. 7,000 men die in that earthquake. Then item two is that other cities of the nations are affected by the same earthquake. And then great Babylon comes into remembrance for God to give unto her the cup of the wine of the fierceness of his wrath. Let's get into chapter 17. Let's get into the meat of this on Babylon. And I'm going to hurry through this. I want to get to certain important things. There came one of the seven angels, which had the seven vials, and talked with me, saying unto me, Come hither, I will show thee the judgment of the great whore that sitteth upon many waters. And the waters are defined as multitudes and peoples and nations and tongues. So she's not restricted to one place. She's not restricted to one geography. She sits upon many waters with whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication and the inhabitants of the earth have been made drunk with the wine of her fornication. So everybody on the earth has been affected by this evil spirit, right? It says, so he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness and I saw a woman sit upon a scarlet colored beast full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. And the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet color and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls. Now, what does that represent? Wealth, riches. Scarlet and purple consistently throughout the Bible represent money, wealth, riches. Precious stones, pearls, what does that represent? Expensive jewelry, it's money, it's wealth. 
having a golden cup in her hand full of abominations and filthiness of her fornication. And upon her forehead was a name written, Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. And I saw the woman drunken with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. And when I saw her, I wondered with great admiration. So people who look at verses one through six, they walk away thinking about the Catholic Church. Why? Catholic Church has great wealth. The Vatican has great wealth. There's a lot of purple, a lot of scarlet, a lot of gold, a lot of jewelry, okay? Also, we know that the Catholic Church has definitely murdered a lot of the saints throughout, the history, throughout history, throughout the Dark Ages, throughout the Middle Ages. Now, to my knowledge, the Catholic Church isn't murdering any heretics right now. They stopped doing that about 200 years ago, okay? But for a long time, they certainly did. And they were what? A manifestation of Babylon, drunken with the blood of the saints, drunken with the blood of the prophets of Jesus. But let's keep reading, though. Let's not just stop there. Because most sermons that I've heard that focus on that element, they really focus on the first half of this chapter, which is, it's good teaching. Amen. Preach on the old mother harlot Catholic church all day long. And I'll say amen with the rest of them because it's Babylon. Okay? But... That's not the place that's being destroyed in Revelation 18. That is a manifestation of Babylon, but the whore sits on many waters and has ma had many different headquarters throughout history, Babylon, Persia, Greece, Rome, and so forth. Let's keep going. And the angel said unto me, Wherefore didst thou marvel? I will tell thee the mystery of the woman and of the beast that carrieth her, which hath the seven heads and ten horns. The beast that thou sawest was and is not, and shall ascend out of the bottomless pit and go into perdition. Now, this is a reference to the Antichrist, also known as the beast. The mark of the beast is his number or the mark of his name. And so when it says here that the beast was and is not, it means that he used to be alive. Now he's not alive, right? Just like where it says Joseph is not. That's what Jacob said when he thought that Joseph was dead. So when it says here, the beast that wasn't is not, he, he was alive, now he's dead, and he shall ascend out of the bottomless pit. Now, think about that. This is where the Antichrist receives the deadly wound in chapter 13. His deadly wound is healed, and all the world marvels. Now, the deadly wound must end his life. Why? Because if someone just got shot in the head and survived, or stabbed in the head and survived, the whole world's not going to marvel. That's already happened. Think about Kathy Lee Giffords down in Tucson, shot in the head at point-blank range and survived. The whole world isn't still marveling about that. But if somebody actually died and came back, the world would marvel at that. So the deadly wound caused him to die, and that's why it talks about him ascending out of the bottomless pit. Now, whether this is just, and, I, and I'm not pretending to know the, the details of this because the Bible only gives us a few scriptures on this, but whether that's just Satan just possessing his body or whether he actually, the man of sin comes out of the bottomless pit, you know, I would lean more toward that it's just Satan using his body. Okay, but again, I'm not going to speculate too much because I, I don't think that the scripture is super clear on that point. But all I know is that this guy or this beast or this antichrist comes out of the bottomless pit and eventually goes into perdition, okay, because the beast and the false prophet are thrown into the lake of fire when, the, when this is all said and done. So whatever spirit is controlling him or whether it's his, the, the real spirit of the man who, who was a, a normal human being up to that point, you know, I'm not going to be too dogmatic on that. But it says that they that dwell on the earth shall wonder whose names were not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world when they behold the beast that was and is not and yet is. Like, this guy was, you know, he's, he's, he was dead. He was alive, and he's dead, but he's still here. He's talking. This is like a counterfeit of Jesus. It makes sense that Antichrist, which, by the way, means in the place of Christ. It doesn't mean against Christ. The, the term anti means in the place of, that prefix. The Antichrist is a counterfeit of Jesus Christ. So it makes sense there's a counterfeit resurrection. Jesus Christ rose to live forever and to be alive forevermore. This guy rises again, but he's going into perdition. That's the colossal difference between this resurrection and Christ's resurrection. Verse 9, here is the mind which hath wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sitteth, and there are seven kings. In the Bible, multiple times, 
A mountain is used in prophecy to represent a kingdom. Just look up the word mountain. So there are seven mountains and seven kings or seven kingdoms and seven kings to go with those kingdoms. Five are fallen, one is, and the other is not yet come. And when he cometh, he must continue a short space. Now, these seven kings and seven kingdoms are referring to the world empires that have gone before. Now, Daniel talked about four of them, didn't he? He talked about Babylon, Persia, Greece, and Rome. When John is seeing this vision, he's during the Roman Empire, right? But there were actually two other places that came before Babylon that were similar empires, and that would be the Egyptian Empire and the Assyrian Empire. So if you add those two, Egypt, Assyria, and then go Babylon, Persia, Greece, Rome, you end up with six, and then the seventh would be the final New World Order system that's yet to come. So that's why John, from his perspective, sees that five are fallen. What are the five that are fallen? Egypt, Assyria, Babylon, Persia, and Greece. One is Roman Empire. The other is not yet come. The future New World Order that still has not yet come. Let's keep reading. And the beast that was, and, and by the way, when he cometh, he's only going to continue a short space. So that's going to be a very short-lived empire, that New World Order, that final seventh kingdom. Very short-lived. It's not going to be like the Roman Empire that goes on for hundreds of years. It's going to be very short, okay? And then it says, and the beast that was and is not, even he is the eighth and is of the seven and goeth into perdition. So what I believe that's saying is that the seventh king, because the eighth king is of the seven, the seventh king, when he dies, and then he is again, he yet is, he comes back undead or however you want to look at that, is that's the eighth. Because he's not really the Antichrist until he receives the deadly wound. That's when he starts claiming to be Jesus. That's when they build a, a great image to the beast. And that's where everybody worships him and, and he, his kingdom really begins in earnest, the, the eighth kingdom. Before that, there's a human worldwide empire, new world order, but then at that point, it changes into the eighth kingdom, okay, which is of the Antichrist. Let's keep reading. The ten horns which thou sawest are ten kings which have received no kingdom as yet. What does that mean? There are ten kings that, that are in the end times at the same time as the Antichrist, not back in John's day or anything else, or even in our day necessarily. The ten kings which thou sawest are ten kings which have received no kingdom as yet, but receive power as kings one hour with the beast. These have one mind and shall give their power and strength unto the beast. These shall make war with the lamb and the lamb shall overcome them for he is Lord of lords and king of kings and they that are with them are called and chosen and faithful. Now stop and think about this. The 10 kings, these 10 world leaders, they have one mind. They all agree and they give their power and strength unto the beast. They give their kingdom to the beast. So these are 10 world leaders who say, give the Antichrist all the power. Let's, let's put him in charge of everything. Does everybody get that? Okay. When are these people going to be defeated? It says, these shall make war with the lamb in verse 14, and the lamb shall overcome them. That's Armageddon. Does everybody get that? That's Armageddon. And Armageddon is where they make war with the lamb and the lamb overcomes them. That's separate from the destruction of Babylon. That happens after the destruction of Babylon. Everybody get this? So you got your seven vials. Then you got the destruction of Babylon. Then you have the battle of Armageddon where Jesus Christ comes on the white horse, defeats the ten kings, defeats their army, defeats the Antichrist, casts the Antichrist and the false prophet into the lake of fire and sets up his thousand year reign on this earth. Okay? So that's what that's teaching right there. Now let's look at the next verse, verse 15. And he said unto me, he saith unto me, the waters which thou sawest where the horse sitteth are peoples, multitudes. These are not, it's not one place. It's not one nationality. It affects everyone. The horse sitteth are peoples and multitudes and nations and tongues. And the ten horns which thou sawest upon the beast, watch this, these shall hate the whore and shall make her desolate and naked and shall eat her flesh and burn her with fire. For God hath put in their hearts to fulfill his will and to agree and to give their kingdom unto the beast until the words of God 
shall be fulfilled. And the woman which thou sawest is that great city which reigneth over the kings of the earth. So what we see here is that the Antichrist and the ten kings, they hate the whore, they burn the whore, and make her desolate. That's what we see in Revelation 18. It would be a very strange interpretation to separate the end of chapter 17 from chapter 18. Chapter 17 and 18 are the same subject. Chapter 17 flows into chapter 18. Okay, because look, at the end of chapter 17, we see what? That the ten horns which thou sawest upon the beast, verse 16, these shall hate the whore and shall make her desolate and naked and shall eat her flesh and burn her with fire. And then what happens in chapter 18? Babylon gets burned with fire. Who's the whore? Babylon. So it's obviously setting up chapter 18 in chapter 17. Does everybody see that? So, again, this is where it would get silly if Jerusalem is Babylon. Why would the Antichrist, why would he burn and wipe out his own capital city, the place where he is located? That doesn't make any sense. Now, if we were to take the view that the USA, the United States of America, represents Babylon, now let's plug it into the equation here and see if it fits. Okay, if we plug in Jerusalem, it doesn't fit. Jerusalem's going to be inhabited again. Jerusalem is not a wealthy place that buys all the merchandise of the world. Jerusalem's already judged three and a half years earlier at the midpoint. Uh, you know, he's not going to burn down the house on himself, the Antichrist and the Ten Kings, you know, on and on and on. And historically, what has Babylon been associated with? More like the Roman Empire, the Persian Empire. If we plug in the USA into this equation, stop and think about it. What is a whore? A whore is not a wife. A whore is not even a girlfriend or a concubine. A whore is one who is used and abused and discarded. If you loved her, you'd marry her, right? A whore, there's not a loving relationship there between the customer and the whore or between the pimp and the whore, okay? And I'm not going to get graphic about this, obviously. We shouldn't get graphic, but the Bible has a lot to say about whores. One of the things it says about whores is that her ways are movable, that thou canst not know them. And that goes along with this, the fact that this great whore moves from place to place. It's not always been the same city. It's not always been the same location. But you see, the whore is one that is used and then discarded. Well, that's exactly what Babylon of the end times, we're not talking about the spirit of Babylon that's existed all throughout history. We're talking about the place in the end times that represents a modern day Babylon. You know, obviously this isn't happening now, but, uh, you know, if it happens in our century, which it probably will, we could say a 21st century Babylon. Well, if the USA is that 21st century Babylon, it makes perfect sense that the Antichrist and the Ten Kings would use the United States to do what? To get into power, use the military might of the United States, use the resources of the United States, use the power and influence and infrastructure of the United States to get into power, and then once they're done... And they say, hey, let's just give it all the beast. What do they end up doing? All right, we don't need the whore anymore. Nuke it. We don't want the whore around. We don't want the U.S. influencing us. Or we want all the power. We want to give all the power to the Antichrist, and we're going to take the USA out of the way. We're done with the whore now. We're, you know, burn her with fire. Destroy her. Kill her. That's what we see here in this passage. The Jews, people have said, oh, it's the Jews, it's Jerusalem. Look, when you got a hammer in your hand, everything starts looking like a nail. And some people, they just get obsessed with one subject, just everything's the Jews. And then there's people, you know, everything's the Catholics, you know, uh, Brian Tenlinger. <laughs> but anyway, you know, there's just people who just go over, everything's the Jesuits, or everything's the, you know, or, or do you run into these people where everything's Islam? All evil in the world goes back to Islam. All evil goes, we need to get a little balance, folks. There are plenty of, of, uh, of devils in this world. I mean, look, the beast has seven heads and ten horns, okay? It's not a single-headed beast, okay? So just this attitude of everything's the Catholics, everything's your... And you, look, you run into people where just it doesn't matter what you bring up, they bring it back to the Jews. 
Doesn't matter what you bring up, they bring it back to the Catholic Church. What you bring up, it's like, oh, the Muslims. It's false. It's all of the, the answer is D, all of the above. Okay, you can't just get all overboard on one enemy. And look, I'm not going to bat for the Jews. We already made that movie. It's called Marching to Zion. Check it out. I'm not going to bat for the Catholic Church. I've already preached a multitude of... We already made that movie too. It's called New World Order Bible Versions. This movie is about a different donkey that we're pinning a tail on. It's not... This movie... Listen, this movie, Babylon USA, that, that God willing, you're going to see on Tuesday night. You know, I hope you'll be there. I hope you'll check it out. But it's not about the Catholic Church. There was a scene where we tied in the Catholic Church, you know, when we were in the historical scene. We ended up cutting it out just because the film was getting too long and we, we you know, it, it's, it's called Babylon USA for a reason. So we ended up cutting out a lot of great material that we had on that. The movie's not about the Jews. It's not about why the pre-trib rapture is false. I was joking around with people saying it's pre-trib safe, meaning that they could play it for their pre-trib friends and they won't panic or anything. Because we don't go into that. You know, we already made that movie. But, but the point is that to sit there and just, oh, it's the Jews. All the evil in the world is Jews. Hold on. There was evil in the world before there ever was a Jew. First time the word Jew ever occurs is in 2 Kings chapter 16. Well, there was evil before that. There was evil at the Tower of Babel. It was called Babylon. It wasn't called the Jews. So Babylon, Babel goes back a lot further than the Jews and Israel and so forth. But they say, oh, it's the Jews, you know, they're the great whore. Since when have the Jews ever been the great whore? Since when are the Jews the ones who are just used and abused and discarded? No, actually, you know what? The Jews are the ones who are doing the abusing and discard. They're more like, the, they're not the great whore, pardon me, but they're, they're the great pimp. <laughs> you know, if we want to continue that analogy, that's what the Jews are. And you say, well, the Jews are controlling the United States. Okay, well then, it's the Jew United States of America then, the Jew USA. <laughs> but the, but <laughs> the red, white, and Jew, you know? But anyway, the point, but the point is, look. Look, Judaism is a false religion. Roman Catholicism is a false religion. But I see people going overboard on both sides where they get this tunnel vision where that's all they see. What about the Hindus? They're bad too. What about Buddha? What about Islam? You know, and then some people, it's just all they see is Islam. Only enemy. Why don't we just realize that it's all bad? And there's only one way, truth and life, and it's Jesus Christ, and no man cometh unto the Father but by him. So when we look at the end times here, if the United States is the great whore of the new world order, that makes perfect sense. Because we can see a global government that uses the United States military to do what? Everything. All their United Nations peacekeeping. Who's the one that's actually doing the fighting? Who's ponying up troops and ponying up the money for everything? Look, who pays for the United Nations? Who pays for the, those military actions? Who is the one who has the most powerful military in the world? Well, I'll tell you who had the most powerful military in the world when the book of Daniel was being written. It was Babylon. That's who had the most powerful military, Babylon. And you know who had the most powerful military when the book of Esther was written? Persia. And you know who had the greatest military after that? Alexander the Great. And you know who had the greatest military after that? The Roman Empire. And you know who has the greatest military today? Jerusalem. No. The one who has the greatest military today is the United States of America. And that's not just me the, eating too much apple pie this afternoon or something and getting excited about America. America spends more money on military than like the next 10 nations combined. There's no question. Our military is in 150 plus nations. That's a global empire. That's a world empire. Just look at a map where it shows where all the submarines are, where all the bases are, where all the battleships are. I mean, we got this thing pretty much sewn up. I don't care what Kim Jong whatever thinks about it. <laughs> Our military is without peer. We are the only superpower in the world. We have no peer militarily. And so it makes perfect sense that we would be compared to what? 
a great military empire like Babylon. People say, well, Babylon was a city. No, no, Babylon was an empire. Yeah. A global empire, a kingdom. Not just a city. It's a city-state. And it had a great empire. The United States has a great empire as well. And so we plug it in to this chapter. Let's just start plugging it in, okay? Does the United States have wealth and live deliciously and think that nothing bad could ever happen? Yeah. I mean, that, that fits like a glove. And I'll bet you, I've never been to Jerusalem. I don't plan on going. But I will say this, I have a sneaking suspicion that we live a lot more deliciously over here than they live over there. Right. That would be my bet from what I've seen and studied and heard. And we have so much wealth in this country, it's, it, it, it blows the mind. People have so much money. Even people that are poor in this country are doing fine. They're doing great compared to the rest of the world. And so we have tons of wealth, tons of gold. I mean, just go down to the mall. Look at all the jewelry stores it's filled with gold, silver, precious stones. Pearls, and there's just lines of people buying it every day, just buying it, buying it, buying it. Where do you think all that gold and silver and precious stones come from? You think it all comes here from the United States? No, it's coming from all over the world. It's coming from the Middle East. It's coming from Africa. It's, it's being mined all over the world. And who's buying it? The United States more than anyone else. Are there other wealthy places? Sure there are. But who's the one who buys the most products, the most goods? It's the United States. So it fits. Purple, scarlet color, gold, silver, precious. Hey, why doesn't it say red, white, and blue? Look, it's talking about wealth. It's not talking about a flag. Okay. Now here's where people get hung up. People say, what? Something doesn't fit. The blood of the saints and the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. You know, and they'll say, well, when did the United States ever shed the blood of saints and prophets and of the martyrs of Jesus? Well, first of all, Babylon throughout history has done that. Roman Empire did that. Roman Catholic Church did that. Yeah, but when did the United States do that? That's pretty easy to answer. In the tribulation. Yeah. Not yet, but buckle up, buttercup, because it's coming. Because of the fact that in the end times, what's going to happen? People are going to be beheaded for the faith right. all over the world. And in the United States, the mark of the beast is going to be implemented. Yeah. I mean, do you really look, if it's, you think it's going to be implemented everywhere else except here? If there's anywhere that the mark of the beast is not going to be implemented, it's going to be a third world place or, or, a, or a, a rural place or a backwards place. The U.S. is going to be in the early stages of implementation. It's going to be one of the first places it's rolled out. Europe, the United States, the most civilized places are going to get it first. And that final kingdom of the New World Order, the Bible represents it in the Old Testament in Daniel with the ten toes. Instead of the ten horns being the ten kings, it's the ten toes of Daniel's image. And it says the toes are mixed with iron and clay. It's a mixture of iron and clay. Why? Because it says the kingdom will be part strong and part weak. So in certain places in the world, the Antichrist grip is going to be stronger than in others. And that makes perfect sense, right? I mean, it's going to be easier to control people in cities like Phoenix, Arizona or Los Angeles, California than to control people in, say, Zimbabwe or Malawi or places like that. I mean, just think about it. You know, it's going to be roll. I mean, look, the places that are slow to get high-speed internet are probably going to be the same places that are slow to get the mark of the beast. And how's, how's your internet speed? It's pretty fast. So you're probably going to be pretty high on the list here in the United States, right? So to sit there and say, well, the U.S. never shed the blood of saints or prophets, well, it's going to in the end times, how can you not see that when many people are going to be killed for the cause of Christ worldwide in the end times? It's the tribulation for crying out loud. And that's a whole other sermon about the tribulation. Well, that's a whole other movie too after the tribulation. So that fits. Uh, it, the U.S. would pick up the torch perfectly from these other world empires. Jerusalem's not a world empire. The U.S. is. Okay, then we get into chapter... 18, and we see more things. We see 
that she thinks that everything's perfect. She lives deliciously. She's going to see no sorrow. Everything's going to be great. She sits like a queen. She's comfortable. She's relaxed. That fits the United States. We believe that we're invincible. I believe we're invincible, and I know that it's not true, but I still feel like we're invincible. Why? Because it's just like we've never been attacked. Think about it. When was the last time our country was actually seriously invaded and attacked by another military? The answer is 1814. I mean, that's all I can think of as far as like a serious invasion of the... Yeah, okay, a couple Japanese troops landed in California and then left again in World War II. Okay, yeah, the inside job. Don't even bring that up. But that's not, a, that's not a military invasion. The last, and don't bring up Pearl Harbor, that wasn't even, Hawaii wasn't even a state yet, and it's thousands of miles away from, from our country, okay? They made it a state afterward, but it was a territory where they have a base so that they could continue the global empire into Southeast Asia. And they didn't like competition from the Japanese. So the bottom line, woo, but, but the bottom line is, though, that the U.S., has not really been seriously invaded or attacked since 1814 when the British came in and burned down the White House and, and they took, I mean, they, they had to evacuate D.C. in 1814, which is called, it's called the War of 1812, but it lasted for, for three years. So you can see America having an attitude of we're invincible. Now, now France couldn't really have that attitude. They've been defeated a bunch of times. Yeah. Right? Every time there's a war, they end up losing. <laughs> They're constantly just, you know, getting... T anyway, the point is, you know, the U.S. could easily say this. It makes sense that the U.S. was... Now, Jerusalem, yeah, there's a lot of violence over there all the time. Not very secure and safe. Okay, what about the merchants? That's half the chapter. I'm not going to belabor that point. That's kind of a no-brainer. And, and if it weren't important, it wouldn't take up half the chapter. Okay. But let's just skip over that. Talks about the merchants. They, all the merchants were made rich. We talk about that in the movie. You'll see that on a Tuesday night. We, we go into that a lot. Never going to be inhabited again. Would that work for the U.S.? Yeah, just, if the U.S. were just completely nuked, well, there's six other continents to work with for the millennium. And this one could just be... So if you're hoping that Christ is going to tell you one day, be thou over Arizona or be thou over Chandler or be thou over... <laughs> Strawberry, Arizona. It's nice up there, right? You know, I wouldn't count on it because it might be nuked into oblivion, all right? So you may end up having to be over somewhere else if you, if you get a lot of rewards. Talks about in verse number uh, 21, a mighty angel took up a stone. We're in chapter 18, verse 21, almost done. Mighty angel took up a stone like a great millstone and cast it into the sea, saying, Thus with violence shall that great city Babylon be thrown down and shall be found no more at all. You're not even going to find it anymore. And the voice of harpers and musicians and of pipers and of trumpeters shall be heard no more at all in thee. Now, this is also a place that's known for its music. I mean, why bring that up in such detail? Because we produce the music that the whole world listens to. Now, have you been listening to the cool music that's been coming out of Jerusalem? <laughs> oh, man. All, those Jeru all that Jerusalem beat music? Yeah, buddy. No, 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 nobody cares. Name a band that, name a band. Look, you could name more bands from Seattle than Jerusalem if you're my age, right? If, you're, if you were a teenager in the 90s, the Seattle grunge, that gives more weight to the Seattle, the, the Seattle theory. The Seattle theory of Babylon more than of Jerusalem. So, I mean, I mean, come on, just we could name several. I can't name any from Jerusalem. Or Mecca for that matter. I don't know, you know, the Mecca Mohammedan maniacs or something. I don't I can't even name a single band out of Saudi Arabia or Jerusalem. I'm sure if we went to, to Barnes and Noble, there'd be a little tiny section of world music where there might be like one CD. But the whole rest of the store. But here's the thing. You go to other countries, guess what they're listening to? American music. Yeah. I've, I, you know, I haven't been, traveled the whole world, but I've traveled throughout Europe and, and, um, and Africa, and I've heard, I heard our music playing. Worldly, uh, United States-type music was being played. 
It says, uh, the, the, no craftsman of whatsoever craft he be shall be found any more in thee. The sound of a millstone shall be heard no more at all in thee. And the light of a candle shall shine no more at all in thee. The voice of the bridegroom and of the bride shall be heard no more at all in thee. Or, or the voice of the groom and the groom, the way things are going in America today. <laughs> For thy merchants were the great men of the earth. For by thy sorceries were all nations deceived. And in her was found the blood of prophets and of saints and of all that were slain upon the earth. Now, those that have the Jerusalem theory, they'll misquote this verse virtually every time it comes out of their mouth. And that's a, that's a weird sign when you have to misquote the verse every single time. Why not just quote it the way it is? It says, in her was found the blood of prophets. But anytime you talk to these people, in my experience, they say, in her was found the blood of the prophets. They add the word the there, and it's not there. It does not say the. Now, if it said the, that would change the meaning of the verse dramatically. Because if it said in her was found the blood of the prophets, that would still not just, you know, it, it still wouldn't turn the rest of the scripture on its head. Because I, uh, I would never take one verse and turn the rest of the scripture on its head. But that would imply at first blush, if it said the prophets, what would you think of the prophets? You'd think of the biblical prophets. If we said the prophets, you'd think of what? Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Daniel, Zechariah, Haggai, Malachi. That's what you'd think of. The prophets. The law and the prophets. Okay, but when it just says, in her was found the blood of prophets, what's it saying? There are prophets that died there. Prophets are simply preachers. Now, a lot of people don't understand this. The word prophet is preacher. And if you study in the New Testament, every time the word prophesy is used or prophet is used, we're not talking about people that are writing scripture or getting divine inspiration from God necessarily. It's just people getting up in the church and preaching. The prophets prophesy in the church and they edify the flock and they preach. That's all that is. And, and a lot of people have this idea of prophecy is always a telling of the future. Wrong. Proverbs 31 says, the words of King Lemuel, the prophecy that his mother taught him, no future events are predicted in Pro Proverbs 31. It's just preaching. It's preaching by a woman, preaching to her son, and it's called prophecy. So prophecy is synonymous with the word preaching. A prophet is a preacher. Now, if the tribulation is going to be a bloodbath and a lot of saints are going to be killed for the cause of Christ, don't you think a lot of preachers are going to be killed for the cause of Christ? Of course, they're going to be beheaded for the word of God. It's the fifth seal. It's crystal clear. So in her was found the blood of prophets and of saints and of all that were slain upon the earth. Now, this is not saying everybody who was killed on the whole earth, their blood was found there because that would be ridiculous because we know people have been killed in every city. Even the smallest town, if you look at the crime statistics, every once in a while they have a murder every 20 years, even in tiny towns. When it says here, in her was found the blood of prophets and of saints and of all that were slain upon the earth. The all there is referring to all types of people other than prophets and saints. So there's the blood of prophets, saints, and just all manner of people, all types of people, all that, are, all that were slain upon the earth, meaning all types are all kinds of people, not just God's people, but just other people were murdered as well. Okay, so if you plug in the USA, fits like a glove, chapter 16, 17, 18, it all makes perfect sense. So that's why I believe that. Now, I do make this caveat that if this doesn't happen for another 100 years or something, or 200 years or 300 years, then of course all bets are off. But today, it's crystal clear who that world empire is, who that great Babylon is. It's the United States. The USA is just like Babylon. But we don't know when Christ is going to return. I believe that he will come in our lifetime, but it is possible that he will not. People in the 60s and 70s and 80s, they all thought the same thing. Did it happen? No. It could be 100 years from now. And the whole geopolitical scene could change by then. But the way it stands right now, if this happens any time in the near future, or if this happens in our lifetime, it's the USA. Now, why go see the film? Well, first of all, because the film talks about stuff I did not, I did not, this was not a spoiler alert type of a sermon, because I covered a lot of stuff that we didn't get to in the film. That's why I wanted to do this sermon. Go see the film, because it's good, clean fun on the 4th of July, number one. 
What other movie can you take your kids to with a clean conscience on, on Tuesday night, right? You know, you can go there, learn about the Bible, learn about the Word of God. And, you know, I think it's a great film to bring visitors to. So if you, if you have any friends or buddies around Phoenix, there's plenty of room. We got room for almost 400 people between these two showings. Bring some friends. Bring some visitors. Get them exposed to some good Bible preaching and some good Bible truth. And I think that once this thing gets, hits, hits a DVD, it's going to be a great giveaway out soul winning. It's going to be great to give to people a great starter video to teach them about being a fundamental Baptist and to learn about Bible-believing Christianity. And like we already had the raise of hands of, of people in our church that were reached by these type of films. And I believe that there are going to be a multitude. We'll have to get to heaven to find out how many unsaved people are going to watch this film just because they're into New World Order films, conspiracy films, films of this genre. They're going to pop in this film and it's going to scare them to death. And at the end of the movie, it says, hey, you need to get saved. And then it gives a really clear plan of salvation. Amen. And they're going to receive Christ as Savior as a result of this film. Amen. And so I appreciate all of Paul Wittenberger's hard work. And it's always easy to sit back and pick things apart and criticize and you would have made a movie about something else and, and you, you know. But here's the thing though, you know, Paul and I have teamed up on these films because they reach millions of people and because they teach the truth. And so, uh, you know, er, er, there are, obviously there are lots of critics out there that, that haven't even seen it yet, but they're already debunking it, <laughs> even though it hasn't even been seen by anyone. They're already criticizing it. But there's already videos on YouTube. Babylon USA debunked. Babylon USA refuted. <laughs> and I'll say this. Pre-tribbers aren't going to be offended by it. Zionists aren't going to be offended by it because we don't go into that stuff. But I'll tell you who's going to be uh, offended. The neocon kind of Kool-Aid drinking Republicans who are really pro-war. The, the kill them all, let God sort them out crowd is going to be offend, very offended by this film. Amen. Very offended. But look, Jesus Christ is the Prince of Peace. Amen. And we don't wrestle against flesh and blood. And I am against warfare. You know, I, obviously I'm for defending myself and, and I'm for defense. But I'm totally against these preemptive wars of aggression. And I, I don't believe in it. I'm, I'm against it. And, you know, I grew up with the same ideology of being a neocon Republican. But, honestly, I don't believe in it anymore. And so that's the only thing that I think is going to bother some people who watch it. So it's going to make a lot of people angry. I don't think it's going to make anybody here angry. But I think it's going to make that crowd angry. But, honestly, if, if you love the Lord and you love the Bible, I think you're going to love the movie. Even if you don't agree with every single thing in it, I think you're going to get a lot out of it. And it, it, it's definitely, you know, I, I just think that uh, even, even fundamental Baptists that don't even go to our church or maybe, you know, I think that they would really profit from seeing this film. And it could open their eyes to a lot of things. So anyway, I'm looking forward to it. I'm excited about it. Who's gonna, if you're going to be there, say amen. Tuesday amen. night. All right, let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Timeless biblical truths that would have been true 500 years ago or would still be true 500 years from now if the Lord tarries that long, which I don't believe that he will. So with all that being said, you know, who is end times Babylon? What does the Bible teach? Well, if you would, flip over in your Bible to Revelation chapter 16. Revelation chapter 16. Let me start out by just giving you an overview of this subject. We just read Revelation chapter 18, and it was about the destruction of a physical place. That's pretty clear in Revelation 18. There's going to be some physical place that's going to be destroyed in the end times, right before the millennium, after God has already poured out all his wrath and the seven trumpets, the seven vials, right at the very end, great Babylon comes in remembrance before God to give unto her the cup of the wine of the fierceness of his wrath. This is basically the last stage of pouring out God's wrath right before the battle of Armageddon. And if you would look at 
Revelation chapter 16, verse 17, just so we can get the timing here. And the seventh angel poured out his vial into the air, and there came a great voice out of the temple of heaven from the throne, saying, It is done. And there were voices and thunders and lightnings, and there was a great earthquake, such as was not since men were upon the earth, so mighty an earthquake and so great. And the great city was divided into three parts, and the cities of the nations fell. And great Babylon came in remembrance before God to give unto her the cup of the wine of the fierceness of his wrath. So it's pretty obvious when you read this that God's been pouring out a lot of wrath and doing a lot of judgment, but now there's one last thing that he needs to take care of. That's why he says, great Babylon came in remembrance before God to give unto her the cup of the wine of the fierceness of his wrath. He remembers that Babylon has not been destroyed yet. It has not been sufficiently judged. Babylon has not received what's coming to it yet. He says in verse 20, And every island fled away, and the mountains were not found. And there fell upon men a great hail out of heaven, every stone about the weight of a talent. And men blasphemed God because of the plague of the hail, for the plague thereof was exceeding great. And then in chapter 17 and 18, we're just dedicating those whole chapters to the subject of Babylon. It's what chapter 17 is about. It's what chapter 18 is about. Now, if there are two entire chapters dedicated to this subject, it's a pretty big subject in the Bible. It's covered a little bit in other chapters in Revelation. It's mentioned in chapter 14, chapter 16, chapter 19. But, I mean, two entire long chapters in the book of Revelation are dedicated to it because it's important. Now, let me just back up and explain to you the concept of who the end times Babylon is or, or what Babylon represents. Now, all the way back in the beginning, you have the Tower of Babel. And that represented a one world government or a one world religion. Because instead of being scattered abroad on the earth, they all joined together into one system instead of being into nations like God had commanded them. And then not only that, but they have a false religion where they're trying to build their own way to heaven or work their own way to heaven. Then later that place becomes Babylon. Then later Babylon passes the torch to Persia, passes the torch to Greece, passes the torch to Rome. And at the time of Christ, the Roman Empire was a Babylon. So throughout history, the geography changes, but the attitude remains the same. That same spirit of Babylon that represents one. You know, after the tribulation now, the English version has about 5 million viewers. The Spanish version, even just one upload of it, has like 13 million views. 13 million, more than English. New World Order Bible versions has over a million viewers just on one single upload. Marching Design is on a lot of different uploads. It adds up to over a million. So it's just a lot of people watch these and Babylon USA is to reach a completely different audience. You know, each of the three films kind of reach a different audience and Babylon USA is going to reach new people that we haven't reached with the other films. And it ends with a plea for people to be saved. It's a film about the wrath of God and so it ends pleading with people to receive Jesus Christ as Savior so that they're not on the receiving end of God's wrath. That's the purpose of the film. Now with that being said, the subject of who Babylon is in the end times. This is not a major doctrine. This is not some important doctrine of the faith where you have to be right about this. You know, we're talking about Bible prophecy and different people have different interpretations and sometimes we see through a glass darkly and as we get closer to the end, things come clearer. So I want you to understand that if you don't agree with everything about the film or if you don't agree with all these finer points of, of Bible prophecy, you know, this isn't really the most important doctrine. This is not a deal-breaking doctrine. It's not a primary doctrine. It's not even really a secondary doctrine. It's, it's almost a tertiary doctrine, okay? So if, if people have a different view on Babylon, it's no big deal. And I think that they could still enjoy the film because I think anyone who believes the Bible would have to agree with a large portion of the film because a lot of the film is just teaching the Bible and preaching a lot of one world government, one world religion, that spirit of luxurious riches and uh, uh, decadence, that spirit of whoredom, that spirit of idolatry. There's a continuous thread from the Tower of Babel all the way until now. So throughout history, various places have been a Babylon. 
Now, the Bible will often use places like Sodom or Babylon to represent another place because they're like that place. So, for example, he calls Judah Sodom because of all the sodomy that they were into and all the wickedness that they did that was similar to what Sodom had been into. So he calls them Sodom. We could also refer to Berlin, Germany in the 1920s as a Sodom. It was like Sodom. Today, we might point to a portion of San Francisco and say it's a Sodom and Gomorrah there or part Las Vegas or other cities that are just kind of dens of iniquity. We would point to those as a Sodom. So what does it mean to be a Babylon? It means a place or an empire or a nation or a city that is like unto Babylon of old. Now, why not literal Babylon? You know, when the Bible talks about Babylon being destroyed, how do we know it's not the literal Babylon? Well, simply because that city no longer exists. So obviously, uh, it can't be that. Now, now, someone asked the question, well, what if you were on a desert island? They, they took exception to looking at current events to interpret the Bible. And they said, well, what would you come up with if you were on a desert island reading the Bible? What then? If I were on a desert island reading the Bible, I would walk away thinking it was the literal city of Babylon. But because I don't live on a desert island, because I, you know, live in the real world and can see things happening around me. Man, Revelation chapter 18, and the title of my sermon tonight is, Who is End Times Babylon? Who is the End Times Babylon? Now, the reason I'm preaching about this is because we have the movie premiere coming this Tuesday night for our new film, Babylon USA. And don't worry, I'm not going to preach the film tonight. So it's not like I'm going to preach tonight. You go, well, great, I don't even need to see the movie. What I'm preaching tonight is basically a lot of stuff that's not in the film. This is not what the film covers. But I do want to talk a little bit about the film and explain to you why we made this film, what's the rationale behind this film, and what's the purpose of the film. Now, first of all, I want to say this. The films that we've made in the past, After the Tribulation, New World Order Bible Versions, Marching to Zion, and now this film, the goal with these films is to reach people. The goal is to reach people with the gospel of Jesus Christ so that they could be saved. And then the goal is also to edify God's people and to increase their knowledge of the word of God and increase their sound doctrine and, and help them to learn something and grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And these films are very effective tools at reaching people. In fact, who here tonight either got saved watching one of those films or you found out about our church through one of those films. That was how you first found out about the church. Look around. So it looks like it works as a way to reach people, right? So this film, because a lot of people say, you know, why make this film? Why make a film like Babylon USA? Well, the purpose is to reach people with the gospel and also to reach people that are already saved and expose them to hard preaching, expose them to our soul winning program and everything else that we do at this church. And these films are literally viewed by millions of people and God willing, this one's gonna be the same way.